You're listening to Investify, preaching financial independence and assisting investors to achieve a more flexible and free lifestyle through smart financial planning and real estate investing. If leaving the corporate world and jumping into this thriving industry is what you desire, tune in and listen to stories of like-minded individuals who made the leap to financial independence. Equip yourself with the right tips and tricks to start your real estate journey, making active or passive ventures that are highly profitable and rewarding. Here are your hosts, Craig Kerlop and Ziana McIntyre. What's going on, everyone? You are listening to Investify. My name is Craig Kerlop, a.k.a. The Fi Guy, and I'm here with my co-host, Ziana McIntyre. A Z money Z, how are you doing today? <laughs> oh man, I'm good. We're having a gloomy day here in Boulder, Colorado. So I drove out to Denver to go look at a bunch of properties because I am under the gun on a 1031 exchange. Uh, so I have to find something by June 15th, which gives me exactly two weeks. So yeah, I'm I'm running all over the world. But the funniest thing is I came home. The property I really wanted to make an offer on was under contract as soon as I got home. The screwballs. I wanted to say something else, but that that was the less, <laughs> that was a more PC word to say. Yeah, the screwballs. <laughs> I know I was trying to come up with something. And then my backup, I like did all the math and realized like that property would make like 4%. So like, why did I even go see it? So uh, a little lesson for you, lady and gents is, uh, do the math before you leave the house. It'll save you a couple hours of driving. We'll see. I got 100%. some ideas up so what my are you, sleeve. What are you looking for? Well, I'm looking, looking for, for a month to month secrets. rental. So I've kind of been looking all over the world. I was first looking at vacation rentals, but just recently vacation rentals have not been doing as well as urban markets. So traditional vacation rental markets were killing it all through post COVID excitement. Um, but that's really shifted now as we're like potentially on the verge of a recession or some kind of correction. So it seems like people are staying close to the cities. So yeah, I've been looking at month to month MTRs and yeah, I was, I was looking in Denver, but actually I showed a property to a client this afternoon in Boulder. And so that one might actually make a good, good little option. We'll see what happens. She didn't mm. seem to like Did it. Did you so. not like it? Okay. Yeah. I never yeah, compete with clients. Yeah. They get first dibs. Yeah. I'm the same <laughs> way. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Now that we've got like a team of agents, it's like, okay, mm -hmm. clients get first dibs, agents get second dibs, and then I get all the scraps. Oh. It's like, all right, well, we can still, we can still make things work. But. Yeah. It all just depends on the lens that you have. But I have a question for you, and this might be valuable for all the listeners. So usually I won't buy anything that I feel like has an obvious objection. So anything that's like dark or a basement level or loud, this particular unit is in a nice complex, but it faces a mobile home park that's like right next to it. And so what you're looking at is the park and it's not that nice, but the rest of the property is really nice. And so I'm just like, I'm, I'm basically going against my rule if I buy this place, even though I think it'll make good money. What would you do, Craig? <laughs> mm, All the I, listeners want to know. I think, honestly, it's it's hard to it's hard to move a mobile home park, and so I, I don't really know how yeah. mobile, mobile park is. Like sometimes they can be okay, like they're just modular homes. But if there's like tires and broken bicycles and crap in like the front yards, and it looks really like dingy, and, and you're gonna get bad reviews, or, or people aren't gonna like it, or they may not feel safe, or all those things. And so I, I would probably steer against it these days too. Like you know, in my past, I was been, I, I kind of tried to figure any way I can make a deal work. I would just try to make it work. These days, I'm a little bit more like, how can I make this deal not work? And is that okay for me still? Mm. And um, try not to rush into it too much. I know you've got you're running into a time limit here with two weeks, mm -hmm. but I would say don't make any hasty decisions until that two weeks is up. Okay. So that would I like make it. sense, but. The Craigie wisdom yeah. of the day. I appreciate it. Craigie wisdom <laughs> of the day. Yeah, we should have that every day. Speaking of every day and wisdom, we're gonna bring on Jordy Clark, who is a friend of mine from GoBundance Real Estate Investor. And he's got a cool little story that we are super excited to share with you. So, before we reveal it all in the intro, 
let's just bring them on the show. Hey everyone, big news. Investify has now partnered with Rent Ready. And yes, we've partnered with Rent Ready because that is the software system that both me and Ziana use to do property management for our rental properties. It makes things super easy. We can send applications, get background checks and credit checks. Tenants, when they come in, can pay rent automatically through there. They can submit maintenance requests, do everything you need to do for property management all in one place. That's why Rent Ready is the thing that we've done. I've been using them for years now. And that's why we reached out to them for a relationship on the show. And so again, super excited to have them on board. If you go to rentready.com and use the code investify, you'll get 50% off your first six months. That's right. 50% off your first six months. If you go to rentready.com, sign up and use the coupon code invest two F I can't wait to see you there. Let us know, hit us up on Instagram, hit us up on wherever, and let us know what you think of rent ready. Uh, Cause again, I think it's an amazing software. I use it all the time. You can access it from your phone. Amazing stuff. So thanks so much. And let's get back to the episode. Jordy, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm unbelievable. How are you guys? We are doing great, man. And it's so, so excited to have you on. Uh, funny enough, I am basically in your city right now. Well, I actually flew to Denver for the day and coming back to Salt Lake, but I'm looking forward to, uh, to grabbing dinner with you tomorrow. Uh, so I know your story fairly well. Probably not that well, though. So I'm excited to actually dig in a little and learn a little bit more. So why don't you tell us straight from the beginning, where did you first hear about financial independence? Yeah, that's a great question. So I heard about it when I was 19. At the time, I, you know, I grew up a contractor's son. I learned how to do a lot of construction stuff. And uh, there was a guy in my neighborhood who he, he's about my parents' age. And he invited me to come flip a house in San Diego. This was in 2009. So we're flipping this house in San Diego. We're living in it. Um, I went because he promised me surfing, surfing lessons. So I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to go learn how to surf. I'm a big snow, uh, snowboarder. Uh, he's going to teach me how to surf. We're, I'll make some, some money flipping this house, you know, fixing it up. And, you know, at the end of the two months or whatever it took us to flip the house, I had made like, call it 2000 bucks. And he showed me the settlement statement where he had made like 60. And I was like, man, we're doing like the same amount of work. How come he's making so much more than me, right? Well, that's where I first heard of financial freedom because he had kind of earned his financial freedom and was able to go and flip houses in San Diego when he lived in Salt Lake. And he kind of taught me a little bit and he was my first mentor. Okay, so at the time you were living in Salt Lake City, you see an opportunity or, or your, your, your mentor sees an opportunity to help you go flip a house. And so that, that was where the, the transportation happened, right? You weren't living in San Diego. Right. Yeah. I was just in Salt Lake. And, and frankly, I didn't even see the opportunity. I didn't know anything about it. He just saw me as cheap labor, which I was. Yeah. $2,000 for how, how long was that? How long were you on that rehab for? Two months. Nice. A thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to work for me at all? <laughs> <laughs> My hourly rate has gone up significantly. <laughs> yeah. We're going to, we're going to unpack why here. And so, okay. So you're 19 years old at the time, right? You, you see this dude making tons of money, $60,000 uh, through this flip. And so then like what that, that was kind of like your eureka moment. So, so what happens, what happens next? Yeah. So, you know, I, I saw that I didn't really grasp it at the time. You know, I'm a young college kid just out of high school where a thousand bucks a month was a lot of money to me. So I was, I was kind of going down the traditional path of getting a bachelor's degree. I was actually pre-med at the time and I kind of took a break from school and I actually went on a religious mission and, and lived down in Chile for two years, came back, uh, got married. And then I remembered, you know, that time in San Diego with Doug Larson and, I contacted him and I was like, Hey man, I'd like to learn more about what we did there. Cause you know, I know that you got paid a ton and I got paid none. So yeah, tell me about it. And he was like, Hey, read this book. And it was rich dad, poor dad. And that kind of opened everything up. Oh, awesome. Rich dad, poor dad is, that seems to be like the, the gateway drug to all financial independence. And, and yeah. so you're, you're what you're 21, 22 at this age or how old are you? Uh, yeah, I was 22. Um, working at a bank and, you know, after that two year sabbatical, I had kind of gone, Hey, I'm not going to go pre-med. I don't really want to be a doctor. And then I, I was like, Oh, we'll go business. 
And then, yeah, things kind of transpired and we can dive in there. So you were going to go pre-med, going to be a doctor. That's obviously like a kind of noble field that your parents were probably very happy to brag to their friends about that you were going to become a doctor. Did you hear any sort of, was there any sort of, of backlash or any sort of, um, you, know, you know, did you have to like get their approval at all for that or, or how, how did that go? Yeah, great question. Um, I've never been one to seek people's approval. I've, I've kind of always bucked the system and done things differently. So I just, I was like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Okay. And so, so as, as simple as that, and, and were there any questions asked though, or people were like, okay, you're going to go from a doctor to a, to a real estate investor. Uh, well, you know, at the time I didn't go straight to a real estate investor. I was like, Hey, I'll get my business degree. And, you know, I got my real estate mm -hmm. license shortly thereafter. So I think, you know, the transition okay. took a lot longer than just Hey, I'm going to go straight into real estate. It was, it was probably another few years before we really got into full-time investing. Okay. Awesome. And I'm curious, like, what did you do with your mentor? Like, were you guys just flipping? There's so many different slices of real estate. So was he getting you into finding deals for him or what, what did he start you with? Yeah. Great question. So, you know, fast forward to when I'm 24, I'm a real estate agent he would basically say, Hey, write this offer on this bank owned property for me. This was back in 2014 when those actually existed. And I got my real estate license. Cause I was like, Oh, I have to have a real estate license. Cause I can save a commission on my rental properties. So he, he would have me, you know, help him list and buy his flips, his rentals. And I could kind of learn that way. Um, it wasn't until later on that we ended up partnering on a few deals. Were you still charging only a thousand dollars a month, or? No, I I moved up to three percent. Three percent, nice. So I guess can you explain, I guess, to some people um, about how having a real estate license could maybe benefit you as a real estate investor? And you said keeping your commissions or um, using your commissions, like like how does that work? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I don't know that it benefits me a whole ton right now. Um, at the time, I thought. I have to have a real estate license to buy rental properties. I just didn't know any better. Isn't that funny? It's funny like how such a simple thing that like pretty much anyone knows today because of the, the all the content and stuff that's produced on real estate investing that you don't need a real estate license to buy real estate. But here we are, right? Um, and so, yeah. And so you clearly you use that to your advantage at least a little bit, right? Um, you were able to, you know, take some of your commissions that you would typically make and save that rather than pay a buyer's agent. Or when I say pay a buyer's agent, I just mean you're able to take three percent, use that maybe towards a rehab or towards some of your down payment or whatever it is. And so, like, what did you do to leverage that? Did you find yourself using your commissions more towards rehabs, or did you just like is that what you were doing with your rentals that you were picking up? Yeah, great question. So when I first got my real estate license in 2014, I joined a team at Keller Williams that was focused on helping investors. And it was a year before I bought my first rental and I did apply my commission towards the down payment. That was actually a seller finance deal. Um, so I just lowered my down payment on that deal. But it was, it was actually, and we can go into that deal in a minute, but uh, it was actually another four years before I bought another rental because I got stuck on spending more than I made and not saving, not investing. I was totally just the typical real estate agent that was just selling stuff. And I was on a very expensive treadmill. Why would you say that's an expensive treadmill? Because most real estate agents, uh, you know, if they're making $100,000 a year, they're spending $120,000 a year. They They feel like they have to have a nice car. You know, they're spending all this money for marketing. They have to live in, you know, a nice house. And, and you know, it, it's just can be very expensive if you're trying to keep up with other top producing agents. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah. I mean, unless you're like a Mr. Mustache, Craggy over here or I, when you don't really care what people think. <laughs> um, but yes, I definitely have felt the pressure of keeping up with the cool agents with their fancy stuff. But yeah, I found personally that if you can take your active income and make it, put it into something passive where you're passively earning, that's like a great way to stack it up. Absolutely. Yeah, one, one way kind of like I shifted my mindset, or I never really shifted, I just never had the mindset of, I have, I guarantee you that I have a crappier car than every one of our, crappier car than every one of our clients. 
And I think the reason for that is, is I like to feel more relatable. I don't want to feel, I don't want my clients to feel like I'm better than them or like, who's this dude showing up in a Beamer, right? Like that's, that's not like who my clientele is. Now, if your clientele is luxury, then okay, maybe it's makes more sense to have a put together car, but like, at least my brand is like financial independence. So like, you know, I got a $2,000 car here. Like that's, that's what we're doing. So is, what, who, who were you targeting when you were, when you were as an agent, Jordy, who, who did you have a target as to like who you, who you like to work with? Yeah. So when I first started, it was, um, it was totally just retail, retail clients that were looking to invest, uh, for about the first year. So at that point in time, it wasn't super important, the car I drove, but the team I was on, um, they had an unfortunate accident with one of their sons. And, you know, at the time they had built up enough passive income that when their son, who was about my age, passed away, they kind of just were like, hey, we're going to like let off the gas and we're going to just retire and live off of our investment income. Here you go. You can run the team and and we still want, you know, our commission split. And I was like, yeah, if, if I'm going to do all the work, I'm going to go start my own team. So. I started my own sales team and then we were paying for leads and just doing way more, you know, first time home buyers, second time home buyers, luxury market uh, sales as a real estate agent. And that's when I kind of slipped into the treadmill of not investing and we were just spending everything we we're making. Okay. And so then how did you, how did you get out of that? Right? So that's an easy, I think anyone in a real job that makes real money, it's an easy thing to look at your peers and, and try to beat them or try to keep up with them. So how did, how did you, how, when did that mindset shift happen? Yeah, that's a great question. So it happened in 2017. Um, I had to buy out a business partner um, in the real estate sales team. And at the time we were selling about a hundred houses a year. And I was making less than $90,000 a year because we were spending so much. Our splits with our other agents were so high. And I was like, man, I'm working so hard uh, and I'm not making any money. We were still spending more than we were making. And so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to like get super lean on our personal budget. We paid off a ton of credit card debt, um, started living way below our means. And at the, at the same time, I increased my income a lot by just being an agent. And then when we sold our primary residence in 2019, we had built up, it was like 150,000 in equity. And we put 10% down on our next house because of course we moved up. And then we took the rest of the money and we bought two investment properties. Hey guys, if you're thinking about becoming a real estate agent like us, you might want to go to Kaplan. That's where I got my license and I found that they made all this really dull information actually kind of interesting and very memorable. So if you're looking at getting your license, see if they have your state. They cover a lot of states, but not all of them. And if you want to get a little discount, use our code INVEST2. So the word INVEST and the number two. Thanks guys. So one thing that I think is really interesting that you kind of broke into is that sometimes people think in the real estate space that having a team, like, you know, someone like Craig, who's got a lot of agents, and I even started a team when I got started, that that's a really profitable way to do real estate. And it can be, but I think it also can be a big drain. And so it's really interesting to hear you say that you were only making 90,000, but you guys were selling like 100 homes a year um, because that could be incredible amounts of money. And so it is sometimes easier just to be stripped down and be your own agent and choose where the money is being spent or if you're gonna pay for leads at all. So I think that's like a great distinction. Sometimes being bigger is not better. Yeah, and one thing one thing I think I'd add to that is is it's when you're a real estate agent or in any business, it's it it it's really easy to just like throw money at things that you think are leads. Like Z, I know we've had this conversation before where it's Absolutely. like, Hey, this is going to, this is going to pay me 10 grand. If, if I just get one deal from this lead source, it's worth it. Well, the thing is, is like, you don't, you may not get a lead from that lead source, especially if you don't know how to convert those leads. And so it's better just to kind of stick to a few different lead generation sources that you know, and, you know, and funnel it up that way. And so Jordy, uh, it sounds like, you know, your, your story is kind of funny because you're like flip flopping between like, uh, you know, you, you get kind of a taste of real estate with your with your flipper with a you say Doug Larson, 
your mentor where you only made $2,000. You kind of go away from that. Then you come back. He gives you rich dad, poor dad. Then you go to med school and then you kind of come back into like, you know, business degree. Then you got a real estate agent. So like, it, it's kind of funny how you just kind of like real estate is like this, this thing that just keeps coming back to you. Um, and so now you kind of like, you figured it out, right? You figured out that magic formula of like, okay, make more, spend less, invest the difference. And that's how wealth is built. And so this is where the, I take it. This is where the game starts to get fun. Yeah. So this is where it starts to get really fun. So, uh, when I pulled my business back, I, I took a big step and I looked and I said, okay, you know, what's making me the most amount of money with the least amount of effort and or spending or anything. And we had lucked into a relationship with a builder. So I was like, you know what? These builder leads, they don't cost me anything. I just have to sit at a model home. I can sell new construction and I'm going to start investing on the side. So uh, it was just me and I had one other agent who had started as my assistant, got his uh, license. He moved into an ISA role when my team was bigger and then moved into a buyer's agent. And we just sold a few communities for this builder. And when I wasn't at the model home, I was out looking at flips. I was attending all of the RIAs I could. I was networking with other investors and wholesalers. And then we started flipping houses. And since 2019, I've flipped 57 houses and I just plowed all of that profit into like burrs. So I'd buy a rental with hard money, fix it up, refinance it. And we've just kind of traded things around where, you know, if I noticed we had a ton of equity in a single family home, then I'd go and I would sell that and we would exchange it into like a sixplex or small multifamily so that we could free up loans in my name. So this is like one to a hundred. Like this is just a lot of information for people that are just getting started. So maybe we could go really deep into kind of one of your first deals where you're really doing it on your own and figuring it out. Um, what would be a good deal to analyze for you? So we'll, we'll go to the first, in 2019, the first two rentals I bought, I call it my two for one. Nice. I had all this cash from the sale of my house and we had just bought our new primary residence. And at the time I only had one kid, she was three. And so I I had brokered a lot of deals for people who bought rentals or flips from the courthouse steps from foreclosure auctions. And so my buddy who buys stuff at the courthouse steps called me one day and he's like, Hey, I got a really good deal. And I told him, I was like, well, dude, I want to buy this. Will you guys lend me the hard money? And he's like, yeah, sure. So I bought this deal at auction, sight unseen. And we had to go through basically a cash for keys scenario to get the former occupant who had just gotten foreclosed out. And then we went in and we fixed it up. And how, how deep do you want me to go? Well, actually, I just want to pause at cash for keys. Can you explain why you would need to do that and how you guys negotiated that? Because sometimes it's a delicate matter. Yeah, great question. So in this cash for keys is the equivalent of a an eviction. So, you know, if you if you buy a property and there's an occupant in there that isn't leaving, they have rights. Even though I own the property, they have the right to be there until I either go through the eviction process or we can come to an agreement to get them out. So, you know, it would have cost me 1500 bucks and probably two months to be able to go through the the legal system and evict this former occupant who got foreclosed on. Or a faster and cheaper alternative is what I did, which is cash for keys. I went and talked to him and said, hey, I just bought this at auction. He knew it went to auction because he actually showed up at the courthouse. And I said, look, we don't want to kick you out immediately, but we need occupancy to the house. Um, If you can give me occupancy to the house and have all your stuff out in 21 days, would you be okay taking $1,000 cash? Because that'll give you you a deposit on your next place to live. And he was like, yeah, I I could do that. So we, we had an attorney draft up agreement and we had him sign it. I signed it. And 21 days later, I gave him the cash and he gave me the keys to the house with all his stuff out. Perfect. Great. 
that sounds like the exact way you're supposed to do cash for keys. Uh, have, a, have an attorney draft an agreement. I can say that all the cash for keys I've done has been like through a text message or through like, yo, if you get out by the end of the week, I'll give you 500 bucks or I'll give you a thousand bucks. And I'm like, okay. And then they leave and I just do it. So I recommend Jordy, go Jordy's way, not my way. <laughs> Yeah. Well, especially if you're giving them three weeks, right? Like you better hope that at the end they're actually going to be out. So yeah, it's good to have a drafted agreement at that point. Well, and that was one of my concerns because he was a hoarder and I mean, it was top to bottom. He had stuff in every inch of the house and I knew that he couldn't get out in three days. He was an older gentleman, very unfortunate circumstances. And so, you know, I mean, kind of look around and go well, there's no way he's moving out in one weekend so yeah so do people ever look at you as like the the mean landlord because you made this old guy like leave his house and all this stuff <laughs> or like you have anybody like that in your life i don't know i've never asked <laughs> never asked well it's good it's yeah. good i feel like i've got some you know they're not really in my life anymore but i've got some people that think all landlords are mean and all they do is just try to extort people for money and stuff so obviously that's not the case we try to give people very good valuable places to live so you go ahead. yeah so let's go back to that deal you were saying how deep do we want you to go we would love to hear you know the breakdown what were you paying for that loan that you took out you know so what was the monthly payment on that what kind of rent were you getting and it, you said it was a twofer. So what was the second one? Yeah, great, great questions. So I paid 225000 at auction for that. And the hard money lender lent me 200000 So I had to put 10% give or take down. And then once we got him out, we spent $40,000 renovating the house. And most of that was uh, the kitchen and finishing the basement. So it was a 2-1, which when I bought it at auction, I thought the basement was finished. So that was a little bit of a surprise to find out it wasn't. So we went in, finished the basement, and made it a five-bed, two-bath. And then at that time, I refinanced it, and the appraisal came in at 295000 Nice. So I was, I was able to refinance 225000 which pretty much paid back my hard money lender, Luckily, I didn't have any interest payments. It just all accrued and uh, paid off my fee to my mortgage broker. So I was really just into it for, it was about $60,000. Wow. So so that's like, you know, almost, I guess it's not like quite a perfect burr because you're in it for 60 grand, but it is still like a, that. that is a very good burr, even though you hear all the time, like, you know, you have to you have to pull all your money out for it to be a successful one, but that's not the case, right? That's like a home run, burr. Sure, it happens, but maybe it happens like one in every fifty or one in every twenty five times, not like every single time. And so I, that sounds like a solid base hit, single double for your first one. And so I guess like let's let's talk about number two there, the one the, the two for. Yeah, so I bought that in July. Uh, we were done with renovations in September and that's when my refinance was done. So it was October 2nd. And I remember the day because um, I got an email from a wholesaler and it, you know, it said, whatever this street is in Midvale, Utah, you know, purchase prices, this, and they had no pictures. And this wholesaler is notorious for never sending any pictures out because they wanted to get everyone into their little open house to try to bid the price way up. And I looked at it and I was like, oh man, that's right around the corner from my first rental I bought. 225, like that's what I paid at auction. I was like, well, it can't be worse than that that house. So, you know, I can sell this to another investor. So I went and looked at it and it was like super clean, rent ready for 225,000. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Like I could buy this and just rent it day one. I don't have to renovate it. The problem was it was right next to the freeway. So every flipper, and at the time, the, mm. the Department of Transportation was widening the freeway. So it, it looked like a mess. And everyone that was going through the house was a flipper. I knew most of them. And they all wanted to flip it. And they're like, no, this, this isn't a deal. It's too skinny. And I'm over here like doing the math in my head. I'm like, I could like burr into this for almost nothing 
because if I can get it for 225, I know it's worth 295 because I have this appraisal from three weeks ago. I'm going to try to get it. So I, I haggled with the wholesaler and I was like, look, Max, I can pay you this 225. Ended up getting it for 225. I sent a handyman in there for 3000 bucks and he did some paint touch-ups, fixed a couple little electrical issues and I immediately refinanced it and I was into that property for $3,000. And funny enough, that's been the story of my investing career. Like I'll do a deal and it's a base hit. And I'm like, oh, okay, like that's mediocre. And then almost immediately after something else shows up in my life, that's like a total home run. Wow. And nice. so do you think that the wholesalers maybe just like looked at your property sold a few weeks prior for 225? And we're like, oh, it's worth 225. And they like just didn't do any research on it? Um, no, because we had bought it back in July at auction. And Utah's a non disclosure state. So they wouldn't have known what it sold for unless they were at the auction. Okay. Um, I think that they had to just tie it up. They made 7,500 bucks wholesaling me that. But I think they had just tied it up like, hey, someone will buy it as a rental. And yeah. That's awesome. So I'm curious if you can kind of go into pros and cons of buying at auction or buying foreclosures, because it sounded like you had helped people do it as an agent. And I didn't really think that people would need an agent for that. So I was a little bit surprised by that. Yeah, I, I imagine for you as someone who's super handy, it's maybe a little less risky, but kind of talking about the fact that people can't see it ahead of time and some of those risks involved there. Yeah. So, I mean, in Utah, I, I can speak to my experience here. I don't know what other auctions are like, but usually, you know, there's a notice of default and then they kind of follow the foreclosure process and they have a sale date. Well, that sale date, the, the trustee or the attorney that's in charge of processing the foreclosure will stand up at the courthouse and he'll, you know, read off, hey, this is the address. This is the opening bid. And you've got to have a check for 20,000 bucks non-refundable if you win the bid. And then you have to fund the rest of it in 24 hours. So it's usually just pretty serious investors that go and bid on these houses because most of the time you can't get in them beforehand. Like you can certainly drive by and take a look and, you know, try to get in, but for all intents and purposes, you can't get into the houses beforehand. And so really you're just buying based off of a worst case scenario where you're assuming everything has to be done on the inside. Now, I mean, you certainly like try to peek in the windows and see if you can see what the interior condition is like without getting shot. But um, yeah, it's definitely not uh, for new investors, I think. Okay, great. Well, Craig, I think we should probably move into the second part of our show. What do you think? I think just, just before we do, Jordy, you kind of hinted at, you know, you, right. you started with flipping one, two houses, and now you said you did 57 in three years. So like, how did you go from one to two to 57? Just, just real quick. Yeah, that's a great question. So what I did is when I first started, I was flipping on 0% interest credit cards. You know, I'd, I'd max them out and I'd go and renovate this house. And then I'd take this wheelbarrow full of cash when I was done and go pay off all the credit cards. So I didn't get charged interest. And then I'd be left with some money and I'd go buy a rental and then do it all over again. Right. Well, after buying a few rentals, I was like, okay, I'm going to reinvest so that I'm not having to like pull from all these credit cards everywhere and remember to make these minimum payments. And just, it was too complex. So I just started reinvesting those profits into flips and we had kind of worked our way up to where I had a full-time crew and we would just go from house to house to house. And then in addition to that, I would, you know, buy other houses and kind of subcontract those out with guys that weren't my crew. And it really, the only reason I was flipping that much was to kind of feed my my rental property habit or addiction. No, that's great. And so, so really, it was just scale through, right at first, it sounded like you're really scrappy. It's like any business, right? You start off really scrappy. And then as you get, you, you build your nest egg, you build some wealth, you're able to use your money in efficient ways to then scale your business. And now you're, you know, you're able to, you know, each each flip fund the next one, and and I suspect that that's that's like a snowball effect where eventually you're doing three, four, five, six at a time pretty easily. Like, how many flips do you have going on at a time nowadays? Uh, you know, we've had up to four at one time, but the whole time I've been I've been helping this builder sell their inventory, 
So I've had a, a, like that's been my day job, right? And then we've just reinvested the flip profits into either rental properties as they came up or more flips. Um, but at a certain point, you kind of get to just bandwidth. And the last couple of years have been difficult just because it's hard to find subcontractors that show up, especially right now. Material prices are all over the place, if you can even get it. So it's 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 been interesting flipping. Oh, I bet. Yeah, especially the last couple of years with, yeah, 100%. Awesome, man. Well, so I guess one last question is this. So where does your rental portfolio land you now? Like, what is your rental? How many, how many units do you have? How much passive income do you have from that? Just roughly, if you don't know the exact numbers. Yeah, great question. So right now we own 28 rentals and I have seven in escrow that we're going to close in the next week off of a 1031 exchange. Um, and then we have another 16, it's a 16 unit apartment that should close sometime in July. So when that all kind of shakes out, uh, we'll be right around 50 ish units. Awesome. And these are all in Utah. They're all in Utah. Yep. Very cool. Very cool, man. So then passive 2019, (laughs) that's like almost just a couple of years. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So passive income. Uh, so we collect right now, uh, gross rents. We collect right around $30,000 a month in rents. Uh, I have a property manager managing most of our stuff and we net right around 7,500 a month. So it, for it's pretty much put us in a place where I could retire today if I wanted. Um, I'm really enjoying what we're doing though. So we are kind of throwing some gas on the fire and seeing where it can go. Yeah, that's okay. that's a great position to be in. Um, I think having that, like, you know, having enough passive income to cover your expenses allows you just to like, you no longer have to do things that you don't want to do. And so, you know, you can always scale back. You can always push the gas. Like I was talking to um, uh, one of my buddies. He's actually a GoBro too, Nate Smith. I don't know if you know him or not, Jordy. Um, but no. he, he was talking about um, a, a pendulum. And he's like, he goes through this pendulum of sometimes he's on this like work really hard, push, push, push. And sometimes he's on this like, chill, chill, chill. And he'll go through like month, month, couple month periods of like just going back and forth in this pendulum. And it's kind of cool to like be able to just lean into that and be, yeah, I don't feel like working too hard right now. I'm just going to like dial back. And when you're ready to kick it up, you can kick it up. So uh, I think that's a, another great part of being financially independent. Totally. Cool. All right. Now I'm ready to get into the next part of the show. Z, are you ready? Yeah, that perfectly right. explains my life right now. I'm on the like chill, chill, chill. So Thanks chill, for chill, saying chill. that. Yeah, eventually you just end I up feel like that chill, just chill, gave, chill, chill, me, chill, chill. <laughs> gave me a lot of uh, permission to be, because I was like going so hard. I was feeling super burnt out. And I'm just like, I'm going to chill right now. But it's so great that you can yeah. make that choice. So I You can it. chill. Yeah, you, it's not it's not a race. Life is a, life is a fun thing. Make it fun. All right, Jordy. So we are about to head into the next part of our show. Before we do, do you have any last words of wisdom? You know, right now I feel like everyone is trying to time the market. And if there's one thing I can tell you is just don't try to time the market. Just your time in the market is always in the market. Like always be buying. What is it? Time in the market is better than timing the market? Or Yeah. However, someone says that more eloquently than me. But yeah, I, lo- I love it. The final four. All right, Z, kick us off. <laughs> yeah. Jordy, um, what are you reading right now? I am reading, what's it called? It's called Unscripted, The Great Rat Race Escape. Ah, Ooh. so you're still learning, learning how to yep. escape. It's good. All right. Love it. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard that one. Um, Jordan, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Buy rental properties. <laughs> there you go. There it is. Just Simple buy as properties. that, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. All right. So question number three, what is your why? Uh, it's it's my kids. It's creating generational wealth. So I've got a six-year-old, a two-year-old, and one on the way. Time with them is super important. You know, like I'm never going to be able to have a you know, six-year-old daughter again as soon as she's seven. It's It's gone. So that's super important. And just as they grow through life, like I want to teach them all of this non-traditional stuff that, you know, you don't have to work until you're 65. And and it, you guys said it before, but this is all about having choices and having options and doing what you love versus, you know, being stuck in a job you hate for the next 40 years, just because you have to pay your bills. Totally. That's right. 
I love that, man. I love that. All right, dude. Make it a job if you love. Life, yeah, last, last question here, um, or last semi-real question. If life were a video game, what would the best cheat code be? Uh, that's a good question. It's probably been a decade since I've played a video game. You know, it would it would probably be the whole financial independence movement where you have the option to do whatever you want after you hit a certain certain level and you realize that maybe more isn't better. Sometimes more is better, sometimes it's not. And just balancing everything and, and living a life that's true to you, because it's going to be different for everyone, is is the real cheat code. Because I think the people that figure that out, figure out that, you know, there's a lot out there to do in life and just enjoy it. Love that. Love sure. it, man. All right. Where can people find out more about you? Yeah. Great question. Um, I have a podcast called The Financially Free Investor. Uh, you can check us out there. Uh, you can check me out on Instagram, uh, Facebook. My Instagram handles at Jordy Clark underscore REI, like real estate investor. Awesome, man. Yeah, so definitely go check out uh, Jordy's podcast. Uh, you know, one, one thing, Jordy, I like about your podcast is, is you said you can't, you can't, like you really don't care if you have any listeners, right? So it just comes to a point of authenticity. You're not really looking to get anything from it, or at least that's what it seems like. And it, it's for your, it's for your daughters and for your, you know, your, your future kids, right? And so that way they can kind of go back and listen and you, they can, you know, you can teach them all of the things that, you know, they can hear all the lessons that you've learned and have that all recorded. And I just think that's like super, super cool. So yeah, thank you. Awesome, man. Well, hey, it was great having you on, dude. Um, I will see you tomorrow, which I don't get to say often. <laughs> yeah, man, we'll, uh, we'll talk soon. We'll see you then. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you. And that was Jordy Clark. Z, what do you think about Jordy? Wow, well, it's amazing to see what people do in just a few years. So just getting started on 2019, which lots of people thought was the top of the market, didn't turn out to be. And then he just exploded from one to two to now 28 and almost 50 units. So yeah, it's really incredible what people can do, especially when they're recycling their funds, like using birds. So yeah, I thought it was very inspiring for people out there that are like wanting to quit their jobs or make a change for themselves. You can really be there in a blink of an eye. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it's clear that definitely during different market cycles, different strategies work at better times. And people would argue that burring might be really hard these days because of increasing labor costs, the houses are increasing. Yeah. Interest rates going up. Yeah. And so all these things are kind of like, whoa, why are we burring? But like, if there's a will, there's a way. And so Jordy has figured out a way to continue to continue to flip, continue to burr and still make it profitable. Is it harder? Sure. But the silver lining to harder things is that there's simply less competition. And so when you've got mm -hmm. less competition, you can easily find better deals. Maybe there's more people in stress uh, that need to sell, whatever it is. Like find a way to play to your advantage if you've always wanted to burr and, and make it happen. Don't let the market be an excuse because that will be an excuse for the rest of your life. Either either prices are too high or interest rates are too high or rents are too vacant or there's a pandemic or whatever it is. Like there's always a reason to not buy. So I would say like get in there, start buying, start taking action and you'll see tremendous results. Agreed. All right. That's my soliloquy of the day. Z, do you have anything to add before we go ahead and conclude? I don't today. All right. Well, if you're listening all the way to the end, clearly it means you like us. So please, please, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes. It helps us out tremendously. And let us know when you do. You can shoot me a message on Instagram. I'm at the Fi Guy. Ziana is. Ziana McIntyre. Yeah, so yeah, definitely let us know. Again, we'd love to hear from you all. And yeah, uh, we'll see you guys all next week. That's it for this episode of Investify. We hope that these nuggets of real estate wisdom lead to more savvy financial planning and a clearer path towards financial freedom. For more content like this, subscribe to the show at investify.com. Don't forget to leave a rating and share it with your friends. Together, we can transform more real estate newbies into successful and clever investors. Thank you so much for listening. See you on the next one.